all through my career, every time a job gets easy, every time you get into your comfort zone and then you put yourself out of it, that's, they're the learning experiences I remember. Being able to do a good job and make sure people understood you did a good job and your teams did a good job is really important because that's how you get recognized. My guest for this podcast is David O'Donovan, the Chief Information and Technology Officer with Aer Lingus. We chat about his uh, ventures over to China when he was a graduate, his time in New York with Accenture, and we talk about the digital transformational journey he's gone on with Aer Lingus and surviving the pandemic and what that has meant for his leadership career. Hope you enjoy. I think for me, most of my job is about trying to look forward, trying to understand where Lingus needs to get to and trying to chart that course with group, with competitors, with everything else and figure out the way to enabling my team to do that. To start with the pandemic, incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult across the entire workforce and everybody associated with aviation because we just felt absolutely helpless and we just felt like we had no control over when this would end. But I think it keeps us motivated and it keeps us I'm um, getting out of bed every day thinking, what are we going to do today that's, that our friends are going to use next week or next month? Dave, in um, 2000, 2001, it was actually quite a good time to graduate um, coming out of college in Ireland. Um, tech sector was good, whether you're doing electronic engineering or yeah. technology. But you were the cohort, weren't you, that graduated in 2001 and then you were ready to start a job, wasn't it, with Accenture? Yeah. And then September 11th happened. Yeah, actually, September 11th happened. And I think I started work on October the 8th. Okay. So we started. Um, we went through our... Accenture do great onboarding. We did five or six weeks training together as a cohort, including a trip to uh, Chicago to the training school there. Mm. Made great friends. Got back to the office, ready for work. Got assigned to financial services. All right, let's get going. And uh, February 14th. 2002 we were called into the managing partner's office and he said sorry guys we got we got no work for you but we've come up with a plan we're going to send you off for a year we're going to pay you a portion of your salary your jobs are guaranteed come back and start again next year so you know that was tough for for lots of people it was tough for me but there was also a, a glimmer of oh i like the sound of this <laughs> what does this mean you're going to pay me some yeah. and i've got the next year ahead of me so yeah I used it as a chance to sort of take an opportunity. And um, I remember I've asked you this before, like in relation to your upbringing and I suppose who's inspired you and that. I think it was, wasn't it, what's the story you told me about your mother who actually left to go to India after being inspired by some book? And I think you were following in your, your mother's yeah. footsteps here, were you? So my mum mom, um, came from a small town in Longford and uh, probably hadn't left home a lot. She had gone to uh university in Dublin which probably even then wouldn't have been that typical um but while she was um in her teens she read this book by Dervla Murphy this travel writer this Irish travel writer who passed away I think just recently actually um and she cycled to India Dervla Murphy and wrote a book about it so my mom was inspired by that um and decided I think at age 21 that she was going to go to India too for a year um she didn't cycle <laughs> what year was this this, this was would have been 68 69 wow yeah. So she got a bus to India. Um, so that means, you know, got on her own on a bus in Dublin, no friends, got over to London and then got a, met the touring party in London and they, they headed off. And I think it took them four or five weeks to get to India because the bus regularly broke down and they had to wait for a party to be shipped out and then they drive again, drove again. And so she spent most of her time in Nepal, actually, at the oh, foothills nice. of the Himalayas. Beautiful. And she spent a year there and she absolutely loved it. And then uh, she came back and married my dad. He'd been put on ice while she went to India. And uh, yeah, so when that opportunity came up with Accenture just after it started, I, I, I thought China. <laughs> so okay. I went to China for uh, for nine months. And, and that was a major milestone for me in terms of just establishing my independence. And you were what, 20, 21 then, was it? No, I was what? 21, 21, 22. Yeah. Um, and I suppose because I'd grown up in Dublin, gone to school in Dublin, lived at home through college gone to college with a bunch of friends from school it was all easy right you, you weren't pushed out on your own to make new friends and find your own feet um so that trip to china i remember being really nervous about doing it but no i'm gonna do it and i, I can come back if it doesn't work out 
but it was one of the most valuable things I did because it really gave me a sense of independence and that actually I can't figure this out on my own. I don't need my group of friends to sort of help me through. The comfort zone, the yeah, comfort just getting zone. out of it. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And that comfort zone point is great because I just, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but all through my career, every time a job gets easy, every time you get into your comfort zone and then you push yourself out of it, that's, they're the learning experiences I remember. Mm. And was it, so for work then, what you, you were you teaching? You were teaching So I was teaching China, English yeah. in China. So and I was, money. Yeah, yeah, I was doing a bit of web development. Um, I don't think I was a particularly good teacher, but the just even getting up in front of a class of 20 Chinese kids and trying to teach them English was hard for me. And, and, and I got a lot out of being able to do it. And then I got involved with the Irish Expat Network in China. In fact, the first weekend I was there, I was invited along to this... Um, intercity GAA match, a uh, GAA team from Beijing, a GAA team, team from Shanghai, and a GAA team from Hong Kong met up in Shanghai and played a couple of matches and drank a lot of beer. And sure, what better way to start your adventure in China by getting to know a bunch of people like that? Oh, you just got to love the GAA community. No matter it's, where you are in the world, there's yeah. always there's always a, a tribe <laughs> of some What was the tribe? I was yeah. never great at playing it, but I always enjoyed the, the social aspects of hey, it. Hey, essential. Um, <laughs> So you had that stint, you learned obviously loads from it. It Clearly it kind of grounded some things and it's still, by the sounds of it, um, stick with you today. But you came back and then I suppose it's time to get back into the seriousness of Accenture and yeah, cracking on. So what was that? And, uh, you Accenture. stayed there for a good yeah, period I'd, of time then, like 10 years or something. I stayed there for uh, the guts of 10 years actually and um, the first couple of years learned a ton. It's such a great training ground for how you do things right. But also you do tend to get a little bit stuck in a particular industry and often in a particular client. So I think I was three or four years in my first client and then three or four years in my second client and then two years in my third client before I um, before I left and moved on. So that's fantastic, but you get into that comfort zone space. It becomes a little bit easy after a while and you're not, you're not learning as much as you could be. And particularly in your 20s, it's such a great opportunity to push yourself to learn because there's less risk you don't have the baggage of family you don't have the baggage maybe of bigger financial commitments you're able to to try something and if it fails try something else okay but good things like i've heard from accenture over the years like you know if you're willing to put your hand up and take it on they will th- keep throwing responsibility at you and you can you can climb the ranks quite yeah. quickly and they'll they'll give you that opportunity if you're if you're willing to put yourself into it right? absolutely um and it's a great environment to push you on. It's quite a competitive environment because, you know, pretty much from your first six months in, there's forced ranking, forced calibration and performance management. And those curves are forced. Those meetings to force the curve are tough where you're arguing about the various people and how they perform versus their peers. So that really creates that meritocracy environment, which is great. And I think if you perform well, you get that recognition. You get that promotion to consultant. You get that promotion to manager and you get the nice pay bumps that come with it. Um, and I think versus going into maybe one of the clients and starting one of the clients, you won't see nearly the same speed of per career progression in most clients because they don't have that structure and they don't have that wealth of opportunity, um, particularly for the, the, the people in their 20s, the more junior people. I think as, it, as you get more senior and you get to kind of senior manager and then onto partner, then it becomes obviously a lot narrower and the opportunities aren't as much and you have to you have to really work really hard to distinguish yourself and that might be doing sales which might be something everyone's comfortable with or it might be opening up that big opportunity with a client that takes a different skill set mm. but after 10 years then yeah. i think what was it you got married and then all of a sudden you find yourself in in new york yeah Tell me about so that. uh after what, how did that manifest? 10 years got married unrelated um <laughs> and then got a call from a, a guy carl walsh that i used to work with in accenture um and he had gone off to new york and he had done a mba in columbia and he'd been working in mckinsey and then he got this opportunity to join a startup founded by this um cosmetics entrepreneur who'd been very successful in her earlier companies and wanted to create something in the digital space Um, And Carl was helping pull together a team and needed somebody to come in and take on the technology portfolio and thought of his old mate in Dublin and (laughs) 
gave him a call and said, hey, would you be interested? And, and I guess it was, I was probably at that stage where I was ready for the next challenge. I think I was maybe 31 or 32 at the time. I had just been married, no kids. And my wife, thankfully, was very supportive of the idea of an adventure. So we said, let's go to New York and let's see what happens. Right. And, you know, if it works out, it's going to be amazing. And if it doesn't work out, it's probably still going to be amazing. So mm. what's the what's the worst thing that can happen? I still admire the courage, though, because you're in, you know, a very structured organization, a safe role. You're doing well. Yeah. You know, um, you, you. but to, to really go from that to going into an early stage startup in a new country on a visa, just married. Like, it's still it's still a big, courageous step. Like, yeah. Surely, you know, sure, it, it you know. was nervy. It was nervy. I think, you know, the barrier out there, the, in my own head, the mental success milestone was get 12 months out of it. Get 12 months out of it and it'll have been worth it for what I'll have learned, for how it'll have tested me, for the experience I've gained. And anything beyond that is a bonus. And obviously, if the startup goes on and does great things, then that, that's fantastic. So I, I always find when you take on a challenge like that, giving yourself a worst case scenario for sort of break even helps me rationalize it in my head. And I figured maybe I won't get 12 months, maybe it'll only be six months. But I'm okay with that risk. I, I was pretty confident I could come back to Ireland and maybe resume where I had been or maybe find an, a job in a different consulting company. I knew my skill set was good and I knew it was at, I was at a good stage in that prog career progression where there was still lots of roles at that level mm -hmm. that I would probably be able to get into. So it probably meant, look, you know, maybe, maybe it's my savings will get wiped out for this risk. But, you know, if I was going to do an MBA, for example, because you now at that age, that's maybe what you're thinking about. It would cost me about the same. So okay. why don't I think about this as my my MBA and see what happens? I love the logic. <laughs> now you're rationalizing. Yeah, that. and then right. you're like, okay, Grant, I can relax now. I've, I've yeah. made the deal with myself. Yeah, yeah. And once I get through, and, and I'll tell you, that first six months was really, really hard. It was totally different to anything I'd experienced before. It was totally unstructured. The sort of... Don't worry, Dave, you'll be grand, you'll sail through it. That my mate reassured me wasn't quite the case. You know, there wasn't, there was plenty of people in there that felt a different skill set was required to run technology. So there was a lot of pressure to get things mobilized. And, but then I think a lot of people thrive under the pressure. And if you don't have it, you don't test yourself. Got it. So that's probably where, if you look back at your leadership journey, you know, those muscles and those strings to your bow that you got from being in that pressurized environment of an early stage business that I know a lot, a lot of people in our audience uh, yeah. can relate to. Is there any specific ones in it? Like if you were to look back and think, God, you know, with hindsight, that is where I got that from. That is where I, I was able to flex that muscle, you know, and sometimes it can be chaos. It can be whatever, anything specific that. You could there was two things that really, that I really took away from that experience, I guess, after two years, w one was, just the ways of working. It, in Accenture, at that point, it had all been waterfall. Big financial services clients. This is how we do programs. This is how we do projects. And requirements get defined up front and get realized 12, 18, 24 months later. It's a relatively static environment. Um, when I went over to New York and started in this company, we did not know from one week to the next what we wanted and we kept changing what we wanted. So understanding how to develop and ship product in a much more agile fashion was, I remember after six months going, what have we been doing? <laughs> Why were we not embracing this sooner? Yeah. Now, I've since learned that it's a much harder journey to switch on agile than just, okay, let's do agile, because it fundamentally changes the way everyone in the, in the chain of technology delivery works. So more of that later. But... The second thing was the importance of marketing and communication. I think I'd always found marketing to be fluffy. As an Irish person, I'd found any sort of self or team promotion cringe and difficult. Um, and I think when you get yourself in an American environment and everybody is selling to you all of the time and everybody is boasting about what they do. Yeah, un unapologetic, you know, they're not you apologetic just, about it's it. It's not, it's considered yeah. a good thing. It's considered confident. I think you pretty quickly realize, wow, I'm being way too modest and I'm missing a trick here. And that doesn't mean, you know, you become, you got to find what's right for you. You got to find what sits comfortably with you. But certainly being able to 
do a good job and make sure people understood you did a good job and your teams did a good job is really important because that's how you get recognized. Otherwise, you're always looking up to a benefactor who is selling your story for you. And I think if you can't sell your own story in a way that you can feel comfortable with, it's difficult to progress. Mm. So I absolutely learned that in my couple of years there, the importance of it. And I suppose, look, not all businesses, like they set out with a, with a you know, good mission and they do everything. And unfortunately, sometimes for reasons uh, we cannot always control, it's not, I suppose, always a commercial success, right? And yeah. You did decide after, how long were you there? Sorry, it was a, about three, three years, years wasn't yeah. it? Three years, yeah. Um, but you did want to stay. You did want to, did you stay? You stayed we in stayed America? in the States, yeah. yeah we stayed in the States. got another opportunity, didn't you? Yeah, got another opportunity. So the, the startup, great idea. Some of the things were well ahead of their times. Some of the things were a little bit late. Um, it, it was trying to personalize product and services and friends and news and content for people based on their archetypes or their personality traits. So a really interesting idea, but probably a little late on the personalization stage because Clickstream data was becoming so powerful as a means to personalize at that stage. Um, and then probably a little early when it came to using influencers to promote. So um, the founder was really ahead of the game in terms of embracing influencers as a means of, of building, building a brand and building a model. Um, so yeah, after three years and, and many ups and downs and many resets, um, and change teams and everything else, I decided we just had our second child and just the uncertainty of not knowing when this might all come tumbling down. And, and when you're on a visa like that, an H-1B visa, you know, if you lose your job, you've got, you got two weeks to leave the country. Mm -hmm. So when we had a, a one-year-old and a newborn, because the kids were 13 months apart, the idea of leaving when, you know, when my wife was pregnant or having to leave when baby was just born was just daunting so um started to look around and I, i'm gonna say almost despite myself ended up joining accenture in new york okay. and <laughs> i say despite myself not because i don't think accenture is a great company i think it's a great place to work but i didn't expect to go and, and do this startup and and bring myself on for, in terms of sort of my capabilities and career opportunities and then go back to almost where i came from I think it's a great reflection of how I felt about Accenture, but the opportunity was a little different. Accenture were setting up an innovation center in a university in Hoboken, which was actually where I lived. <laughs> the university was actually two blocks from my house and they needed somebody the to sign. <laughs> set up and run this innovation center that paired PhD students with industry clients and got them doing PhDs and PhD projects on real life client problems. So a little bit of my sort of consulting experience, my client relationship management experience from my sort of Dublin career with my sort of startup and entrepreneurial experience from my New York career, and it was a nice combination. And from a lifestyle perspective, it couldn't have been better because I was two blocks from the house. There was no travel. Um, and I really enjoyed that stint. And I really enjoyed that um, couple of years in American academia. Learned a lot from the professors, particularly this guy, Professor Bill Rice, brilliant man. Read, wrote many, many books, really deep thinker on systems and entrepreneurship. Um, and I got a lot out of spending time with him and learning how he thought a little bit. Okay, yeah, I see how the, if we look at the the, the, the learnings of everything, so from management consulting, big multinational, Irish business, um, Irish customers here, out in a startup, scale up business, the whole you yeah. know plethora of things that go with that. Then looking at academia, research, another kind of brand new arm of, of Accenture, and how to all kind of piece together, but bringing it to the present, right? Yeah. How did it manifest that you are now, you know, the chief digital and information officer for Aer Lingus, a love brand in Ireland? Yeah. Tell me how you went from that to, to where you are right now. So we were getting to sort of the end of our six years in the US. And, and at that point, you kind of decide, do you want to get a green card and stay and probably move out to the suburbs and, and all of that? Or do you want to move home? And, you know, I might have been on the fence about it, but my wife was pretty sure we'd done our stint. She wanted to be back uh, around her family, her friends. And of course, I was very attracted to that too. So started to look around a little bit. Um, and then a friend of mine in New York who'd actually helped connect me with the Accenture job in New York, passed me on a, an, a, 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 an inbound opportunity from a recruiter um, who was 
looking for somebody to go into Erlingus and head up their digital and mobile division at the time. And and I hadn't thought anything about the aviation. I'd never worked in aviation before. Um, I suppose I hadn't really thought about Erlingus even as a tech company. I remember in the interview saying, so, you know, do I, am I responsible for the tech on the aircraft? And I was reassured when the answer was no. I was like, okay, good. <laughs> um, but I, I spoke to the CFO and I spoke to the COO and I got a good feel for the company. I got a good feel for their ambition. And then I started to read up a little bit more about it. And I, I guess I'd caught up with Aer Lingus news because when you're growing up in Ireland, Aer Lingus is front and centre. And, you know, most of us have had our first, certainly my generation, had our first flight in an Aer Lingus aircraft. And then I hadn't really been keeping up to speed with the acquisition by IEG and the growth potential and growth ambition of Aer Lingus. So those conversations I was having in 2017 was two years after the acquisition. And I was like, well, th- these guys are, these guys have a, a really ambitious plan here. And actually, yeah, it is a pretty digital company and they have a huge amount of technology. And actually, they're a little bit like financial services because that industry and aviation were the two industries that sort of embraced technology first, I guess, in the 60s and 70s with mainframes. Um, so a lot of the sort of understandings and experiences I'd had in financial services and the challenges were quite relevant in the aviation industry as well. So I, I, I sort of found myself getting increasingly attracted to the job over the course of three or four weeks and and then I was lucky enough to be made an offer and I said okay let's do it um, and that was a big one as well that was like oh my gosh what am I going into I know nothing about aviation I've never run a big engineering team like this before um, I've never worked with this myriad of systems what's it going to be like mm. um, so again I had the little talk with myself around What's my logic, rationale? What, what's yeah. my yeah, logic and rationale? What's my worst case scenario here, and, and yeah. am I okay with that? And um, I guess five years later, I'm I'm, I'm I love Erlingus, and I, I think we've achieved a lot, and there's a lot more we'd like to achieve. I want to talk about the pandemic and Erlingus, and I want to talk about um, obviously it, it was it was it was tough for a lot of people, and you know a lot of we a lot of people we know personally, um, you know, my family, there was pay cuts during the pandemic. It was it was tough for a lot of Erlingus employees. Um, which you can reference now in a moment, but the, the, the area that fascinates me the most is how the game has changed for digital in general. Yeah. You know, whether it's yeah. ordering pizzas, booking taxis, like what consumers' expectation is around tech yeah. um, and how the airport's changed, the whole thing. I'd love to kind of get your own thoughts around the impact of the pandemic on Aer Lingus and then what it's actually meant. Probably more of a positive note, actually, I would imagine, on, on accelerating some of the adoption of some of those digital transformation yeah, elements. Um, yeah, no, it's a great observation. So to start with the pandemic, incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult across the entire workforce and everybody associated with aviation because we just felt absolutely helpless and we just felt like we had no control over when this would end. And there was just three or four times over the two-year period where we thought, the end is in sight, let's publish a schedule, let's start to ramp up again. And disappointed, disappointed, never happened. Another wave, vaccines not quite stopping infection the way we hoped. So across the whole workforce, from the cabin crew, from pilots, from ground staff, and the tech teams, just incredibly difficult. And people took a huge amount of pain to help the business get through it. Because it was touch and go for all airlines for a period there. We needed financial support from investors to help us get through. And thankfully, Aer Lingus being part of IAG Group, we had that support and, and we got through it, but it certainly wasn't easy. Um, then you snap out of the pandemic and you have two or three years of people becoming incredibly comfortable with digital interactions. So while plenty of people expected a decent mobile app and gravitated straight to check-in kiosks and everything else before the pandemic, plenty of people didn't too. and Plenty of people would not be comfortable using digital technologies to self-serve. By the time the pandemic was over, that had all changed. Expectations were totally shifted. So it went from, I don't think it was ever nice to have, but it went with something that was important before the pandemic to something that's absolutely table stakes now. Um, and that's been, I guess, good for me and my teams because the business is extremely focused on understanding how technology can drive growth and drive transformation 
And we're at a really exciting stage in Aer Lingus' history now from a technology perspective because we have this tremendous appetite across the business to modernize the technology estate, tremendous appetite to fix our um, self-service capabilities, make sure our mobile app can do almost anything you would need to do on the phone with somebody, make sure that our airport experience is as digital as it can be. And, and that's that's what I love to do. And one of the great things about working in a brand like Aer Lingus is when you get it right, everybody knows about it, everybody uses it, everybody says, hey, that's great. Of course, the flip side <laughs> is when you get it wrong, <laughs> and we do often, you get the same enthusiastic feedback. So it's it's the blessing and the curse, but, but I think it keeps us motivated and it keeps us um, getting out of bed every day thinking, what are we going to do today that's, that our friends are going to use next week or next month? I think what's remarkable about Aer Lingus um, also is, like a, I know a lot of our um, audience and, and, and viewers who might be in leadership positions for maybe historically non-tech type businesses, it's not the, 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 the everyone's a tech business in a certain extent, yeah. but when an organisation looks at IT more so as a cost centre, when it really makes that transformational shift from cost centre to value centre, it can be incredible for someone that, you know, particularly yeah. at your level. For those people that are listening and viewing this um, are in an organisation, you know, maybe it's in the FMCG or whether it's in some other kind of business where you're really trying to shift the dial, like make that movement. You know, sometimes it's a culture shift. It's a, it's, there's a lot involved in that, right? Yeah. Is there any kind of, any, I suppose, learnings or anything that, any, if you were to advise somebody who is going on that journey from cost centre conversations yeah. to value centre and demonstrating that, is there any... Yeah. Anything you could say about that? I, I think it's a really good question too. Um, and I certainly saw that transition happen over the last five years in Erlingus. And, and I don't mean like, you know, five years ago, it, it was it was hard to get the sort of the obvious stuff done. But when you start moving from that, this is an absolute slam dunk, we should do it. It's going to drive revenue or it's going to save costs too. This is interesting. It might deliver the upside we hope it might be really successful but it's almost something that we should have in place as a hygiene factor in the future let's do it and get ahead of us almost that, that shift from okay i'm going to choose the text top 10 percent of everything you want to do because i have to do it so you know what i'm going to choose the top 30 percent because i think it's the right thing to do that shift is really powerful when it happens because suddenly you have so much more flexibility and the attitude and the appetite of the business for failure changes they become much more accepting of the fact that you're going to try all this stuff some of it's going to work some of it's not going to work when it doesn't work just learn don't don't witch hunt don't point fingers just learn and don't let it happen again and you get better and you get better and you get better and then when you really need to do something you can do it so i think that's one part of it let's be honest the other part of it though is credibility does the business believe you can deliver because if they don't they're going to be far less willing to take a punt because you're taking two punts, not one. I'm taking a punt that the idea will be successful and I'm taking a punt that the team can deliver it. If you can remove the ambiguity about the second bit, oh, the delivery is assumed. We know this team will deliver. And so the risk is just around the idea and how are we going to measure the value that the idea will generate so that we can incrementally get it into the user's hands, get it into production and understand when we've hit a, we've missed a milestone, we've missed a, a value metric, let's pull back, let's change the plan. So that sort of, look, nobody knows when you write a business case exactly how it's going to play out. And actually, the day you get that business case signed off is probably the day you know least about what you're going to implement. Every day after that, you know a little bit more. And getting that mindset where we're one team prioritizing together based on the latest information we have, and we should change our mind all the time, that's really powerful. And you referenced Agile and what that really means for, for what you've learned and what you've experienced. In an Aer Lingus context then, is that what you mean in relation to that from a delivery perspective on how you actually gather requirements from the business, how you release, yeah. how you do iterations of products, different functionality? Is It's all that encompassing that. Th that's, surely that was a transformational shift yeah. though in the way things were done from an outside in perspective. Yeah. Like, so that, that must have been a lot of layers. That was kind of one of our pandemic wins. So the pandemic hit... March 2020 and the first direction was okay guys we need to 
we need to cut the team by two thirds, whatever. So we said, okay, but, but let's cut the team based on what we absolutely have to do. So let's first look at our backlog and let's establish exactly what we have to do over the next year, regardless of the situation. If we're going to be in business in 12 months time, we have to do it. And then let's decide what team we need to support that. And then let's decide if we can afford it or how we can afford it. So, so we did that and, and the net result was maybe we, the team halved, mo- mostly sort of, not, not employees, but mostly contract resource and sort of flexible resource. We cut it down in half and then we got cracking in the stuff that was deemed absolutely table stakes. We have to do it. Um, but we said, right, let's try and deliver differently now. We've got a much smaller team. We have a much more focused business that, let's be honest, don't have as much to do every day than they used to because we're not, you know, doing lots and lots of flights every day. We're not constantly managing fares and changing fares. So let's take advantage of the capacity we have out of the pandemic to change the way we work. Um, I'd say two years later, we now have about 70% of what we do operating in an agile fashion. 12-month value streams funded with a set of KPIs and a list of ideas that may or may not help realize those KPIs. And the objective is to get through those ideas as quickly as possible to figure out what the good ones are from the bad ones and use those to drive the KPIs. Now, that's a fundamental shift, not just in how technology works. That's a fundamental shift in how business teams work. Because, you know, in many organizations, the business resource see engagement in tech projects as kind of a side of the desk job. Something you do along with your day job or in the evenings, I have an hour here, an hour there. And, and you just, you hand it to technology to deliver and come back to you when it's done. Value streams and, and iterative ongoing management of a backlog requires a much closer alignment with technology teams and a much deeper understanding of how your product's performing every day, every hour, every minute. And that requires quite a shift in terms of the expertise required in technology and the business. And that's the journey we've been going on now. So we have a product management function now established across our business teams and the product managers effectively hold the tension with technology to make sure we're working on the right stuff, we're making the right decisions in a timely fashion. And now the trick is making sure we're empowering those product managers to make the big decisions. Not do what your traditional sort of hierarchical organization does and bubbles those decisions up to, you know, an executive team. Various bottlenecks. Yeah, Yeah, no, no, no. You guys make the decisions. You're the ones living, breathing the product every day. Here's the top level direction, right? So self-service is really important. You prioritize whether it's self-service option A, B or C that we move on first based on the value to deliver. So getting out of the way of our teams and empowering them to deliver to our KPIs, that's what I love about this stuff. It's helping them deliver as opposed to telling them what to do. How hard is it to be part of a big group though when you're trying to have your own identity, you have your own, I suppose, agenda, you listen to your own customers, you know, it's a very, it's a very emotional brand for all the right reasons um, in Ireland as well. Like what are the challenges um, when you're part of a bigger group one would assume, you know, that there's a bit of competition maybe from, from yeah. resources, a bit of waste maybe as well, you know, in relation yeah. to doing the same for multiple different brands in, in particularly in the IAG group. What what can you yeah, share? Yeah, it's a it's um it's really interesting. And and it changes, right? I think that the dynamics have changed over the years. When I started first, there was a big push on centralizing everything and group technology teams delivering products and services and features to each of the opcos. Pure matrix kind of. Yeah. And and that that was always a bit challenging for the smaller opcos because, you know, we in Aer Lingus, for example, felt, well, hang on a second. How are we, how is our priority ever going to deliver the same revenue bang that a British Airways priority might or deliver the same NPS bump that something for Iberia might? So we, um, the smaller opcos really determined to, have their own technology capability, but delivering two group patterns, group architectures, group frameworks. And, and I think we got a, a new, a group CIO came in, um, in, in September, 2019, and he really, really helped in sort of just establish that model. We kind of call it now a hybrid where the technology capability sits right at the business, in the business. There's no, you know, back to group, come back, back to, the, 
the, the business and the technology and it's same, are it's working integrated. together, integrated, yeah. because they're the ones who understand the Aer Lingus business best or the Vwelling business best or the Iberia business best. But it's incumbent upon us to make sure we're moving in a common direction with the rest of the group. We're recognizing synergies. And so earning that trust took some time. Getting the group comfortable with that idea that it's a hub and spoke model with a lot of capability in the spokes working closely with the business. Again, I think it comes back to that stakeholder management. It comes back to trust that you build up with the group CIO to say, look, no, I, I get the vision. Trust us, we're going to stick to the patterns and the architecture we've agreed, but empower us to deliver for our business. And I think that's where maybe um, in the past, people might have stuck their head in the sand and avoided disclosing being really open and honest about what we're doing and where we're going and celebrating what's going well and, and, and asking for help when it's not going badly creates that trust with the group. And equally, the group CIO is able to talk about the successes of Erlingus, the successes of Welling, the successes of Iberia, the successes of BA, as all under the umbrella of technology. So I think it takes a long time for that to settle down and find the right tension point. And, and something can happen that upsets it again. And it, so it's a constant process that you have to work through but when you get it right it's so enabled and so empowering mm. because you're able to just get on with it then mm. and and that's that's what we ultimately want to do we want to keep our ceo and, and our exec teams happy because we're delivering product for our employees we're delivering product for our customers that it's, helps it's such a conscious mentality though isn't it it's such a real you know creating that psychological safety creating that culture within a business um, that it that it works and it's, it's, it's not taken for granted and, you know. Yeah. It, it, I think that's quite, I think it's inspiring. I think it's good stuff, you know, in I relation think it, to it, how other businesses could could operate maybe more effectively. Yeah, it's, it's look, it, it often it comes down to the sort of the leadership style and the strengths and weaknesses of the the leader. I'm not somebody who is going to get into the code, is, is able to get into the code and tell you, you know, you should have used that function or that routine instead of that one. I'm not qualified to do that. So I have people on my team who are much more technical to me than me, able to set that direction. And, and it's my job to make sure I'm hiring the right people to do that, to, to complement what I can bring. I think for me, most of my job is about trying to look forward, trying to understand where a lingus needs to get to and trying to chart that course with group, with competitors, with everything else and figure out the way to enabling my team to do that. So probably 80% of what I do is, is, is that communication, stakeholder management, teams sort of alignment and, and just unblocking. I'm going to get a little heavy now for a moment, if that's okay, <laughs> Dave. Um, despite, you know, we can be, we can, despite, you know, how much we plan for things um, and we can be in the trenches, sometimes a bit of a hamster in a wheel, sometimes when you're mid pandemic and you're, you're in an airline and there's loads of unforeseen things, um, but something unforeseen happened to you personally with your family and your wife, Ingrid, um, and she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Yeah, so... Uh, if you feel comfortable, you yeah. know, I think it's... Um, yeah. From a leadership, like, I, I'm really curious to come at it from an angle of how do you feel that shaped you as a leader? Like, you know, thankfully, thank God she, she's yeah. okay yeah, now. Yeah, thankfully and she, she's, she's good great. now, yeah. Um, so um, what can you share, if you don't mind? So it, it's, it's like you said, there's... The lesson out of this for me was definitely seize the moment um, in, in personally and professionally seize the moment because so the pandemic hit February, March 2020 and Ingrid was diagnosed then with breast cancer in July 2020. Um, so a time that was incredibly stressful professionally, suddenly all the professional worries were put into perspective mm. because you're thinking about your young family. Um, I, I think at the time the you know, the kids were, were three, six and seven and it just, it just reset everything. Um, now, in some ways, the pandemic was helpful because, number one, <laughs> she missed nothing <laughs> over the two years. Nobody was going out. Nobody was going on holidays. Nobody was going to parties. Um, and number two, I was at home the whole time because we really talked quite a bit around what do we tell the kids and how, how big a deal of it do we make or not? And I think if it had been normal times and I was in work every day and I was traveling regularly, it becomes much more of a 
gap, if she's not able to look after them or she's at treatment or whatever, then you're, you have a much different conversation with kids. But actually, because the pandemic hit and mom got sick and dad's around all the time, all happened about the same time. And everything was strange. So I, I think, I hope for the most part, the kids were sort of aren't traumatized by it or affected by it. We were very lucky. We got an incredible um, lady in to help us, a Brazilian lady called Paula, who was just a godsend. And she really treated it as her mission too, to help get us through it. So Ingrid had an incredibly intense, I'd say 18 months of treatment. She had everything. She had surgery, she had chemotherapy, she had radiotherapy. And she felt terrible for a lot of it. But um, yeah, we got through it. And and the, the adrenaline almost carries you through during the crisis. And then it's afterwards you sit back and go, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> that was heavy. Yeah. So, um, you know, hopeful that that's, and um, thank God she's feeling great now and back to herself and, and that's behind us. But you just never know what's around the corner. So you got to take your opportunities and live each day. Yeah, see at the moment. Okay, thank you for sharing, yeah. Dave. Um, on a more of a lighter note then, <laughs> I'll go back up if that's okay. Um, it was uh, when, when, when we analyze people that might go from kind of mid-level management roles um, and then want to take that maybe next step up into more CIO, CTO, more maybe business technology types of roles. When you look back, like, are there any really specific learnings that you think helped you or is there any advice or any things that you'd like to say to maybe people that have that ambition, but for whatever reason, it's just, they're not there just yet, right? Is there any kind of Dave's top tips <laughs> in relation to helping some of our listeners accelerate that growth into strategic senior management? I, th I think the number one piece is, is communication. I've probably said it a few times already, but as a technologist, um, the excitement and the passion is in the solving of the problem and, and explaining how the problem has been solved and, and you know, getting excited about the, the intelligence or the breakthrough to solve a particular technical problem. But actually, as a business user, that's just, in many cases blah 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 okay now it works great is it going to keep working and and just learning how to understand what the business user is interested in and the level the business stakeholder wants to hear you speak at and then being able to moderate that for your audience i think is the best way to be heard and i think once you're heard then you can influence and once you can influence then you can lead so if there's people out there that are, you know, want to sort of move into more of a business leadership, business technology leadership role, I think the first thing to really work on is that ability to communicate, that ability to moderate what you're saying, get your examples ready, learn how to give analogies that, okay, I might give an analogy in a meeting and my, you know, one of my engineering um, team will be there and will kind of cringe, I give this analogy that sort of is about 70% right, but the business user might be nodding along because like, oh yeah, I get it. I, I know what you mean when you put it in terms of an Excel macro, or I know what you mean when you put it in terms of a um, profit and loss um, statement or whatever. So it's just learning how to, to, to meet your audience where they're at, communicate them, communicate with them and be heard is, is I think number one. And then I think number two is be passionate about the business, like care about the business, care about the business outcomes, care about the drivers, for the business because that's what ultimately the people that are funding your work will want to care about and if you can talk about value to them in their language you know you're on the same page half the job is done you're aligned we want to achieve the same thing so now let okay tell me what you need to achieve it whereas if if you go down a rabbit hole and start for example talking about cloud for reasons because it unlocks all these great AWS capabilities or Azure capabilities that allow us to do these cool algorithms or allow us all use all these cool functions, it's gone. But if you talk about cloud around resiliency, stability, speed to market and cost, oh, so when we don't need it, we can turn it off. Yeah, okay, I, I like the sound of that. Then, then you've got an audience that wants to listen. So it's just, it's understanding how to moderate the message, I think is, is really key to influence. And then once you have influence, it's much easier to lead. We have a tradition on this podcast. It's called Pass, Pass the Ball. Um, you, uh, I want you to nominate somebody, if you don't mind, somebody that we could invite 
as a guest on that on one of our future future episodes. Is there anyone that comes to mind? Ooh. Someone that you think would be a an interesting, fascinating, inspiring leader like yourself? Thank you <laughs> for the compliment uh, and the uh, hey, and the challenge. Um, so uh, there's a friend of mine who's recently moved back to Dublin, uh, a guy called Luke Barrington, and he works um, for Google. He he runs one of their big machine learning AI teams based in Berlin. Um, and he was in Google X before that, and he was a, a startup entrepreneur for eight or ten years before that. Fascinating guy. I uh, don't know if you'll appreciate the nomination, but uh, <laughs> he'd be a great guy to talk to. I will guilt him into it. Don't you worry yeah. about that. Dave, it's been a privilege chatting to you. Thank you for your time today. No, thanks, Neil. Really enjoyed doing it. Appreciate it. Yes, sir.